The Danites, or more specifically the Danai, are mentioned by Homer, Euripides, Strabo. There's a whole host of, um, we'll call them ancient historians, chroniclers. And so, for example, Euripides says, Danis, having arrived in Argos, made a law that those born of the Peles Giotto, or Giotai, throughout Greece should be called Danai. And we begin to see the name spread to the Peloponnesus and afterwards to all Greece. So you're going to find that same principle we saw where they took the town, Laish, and then he named, named it Dan. Um, this is going to be their pattern. <laughs> Good morning. Well, I know I will be back with you next weekend live. I'm looking forward to that and filling you in on some very interesting things. Um, but I'm joining you. I hope you can uh, endure one more week. It's been difficult, but here we are. Um, so we have been uh, on the subject of the divided houses, house of Israel, northern house of Israel, northern kingdom, Ephraim, Samaria, and the southern kingdom, Judah. Now we haven't really touched on Judah just yet, um, and there is something I should mention, which is yes, the people were carried away in the southern kingdom for 70 years into Babylon. What is often not discussed is the fact that of all those people that were deported, it's relatively a small number. We're talking about maybe 50,000 people, maybe, who returned uh, back to Jerusalem. So we're also going to have to deal with some people who will pop up in other parts of the world, uh, not so much lost tribes of the north, but these are people who formerly or previously belonged to the southern kingdom who didn't return. Now, whether they stayed in the land of Babylon and, and uh, lived their life there or not, or if they migrated, we will have to investigate. But today we're going to take a look, and it's more of an introduction. Again, none of this can be exhaustive. It's just like introducing something putting enough information out there, and then we basically go back and we can micro-examine each one of these. So today we're gonna to look at the tribe of Dan. And what we know, Dan is obviously the fifth child of Jacob Israel, uh, Jacob who became Israel, uh, through Bilhah, which is Rachel's handmaid. And we know at the birth of Dan, uh, Rachel says, God hath judged me and hath also heard my voice and hath given me a son. Then we go to the passage where uh, Jacob, who is Israel, is going to bless his children, the, the children of Israel. Now, I'm not really sure that Dan's receiving a blessing so much as a prophetic word. Uh, what it says about Dan in Genesis 49 Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backward. And then this strange connection, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. This is all word spoken to Dan. Um, so I'll say a few words here because I, I want to kind of build a history. Um, we know that, for example, Dan was full brother to Naphtali. So some of these are, because it's not all the same mother, so he's full brother to Naphtali. And we learn that this is another strange thing. If you turn to Genesis 46, and I'd like you to turn there so I can show you something. In Genesis 46 and 23, we have the mention of just one son of Dan. If you take a look what comes before that, and of the sons of Benjamin were Bila, Becher, Ashbel, Jera, the sons of Rachel born to Jacob, all the souls 14. The sons of Dan just says Hushim, that's all. 
singular. So it's a little bit strange. Um, and then we have one other mention in Numbers 2642, uh, where it says, These were the descendants of Dan by their clans through Shuim, through the Shuamite clan. And these were the clans of Dan. All of them were Shuamite. And the number of those, they numbered 64,400. So something interesting here. Um, if you look at the, I just jumped from what is said in Genesis 46 to Numbers, which is a big gap of time, obviously. But it's strange how in the first reading, we're not seeing that he had a bunch of sons, and yet the census shows, well, the first census out of Egypt, they were actually 62,700 fighting men. The second census, which I just read from, 64,400. Now, why is this important? Because we know at some point, there's a, a good reason to see they're strong in number, but at some point, Dan just disappears. Um, we've got references to different family members. Uh, for example, and I'll see if I can spin there and read it to you. It's right at the opening of Numbers. Um, let's see here, Numbers 1. And um, we're looking at one man from each tribe, each the head of his family to help you. These are the names of the men who are to assist you. And in 112, we have the reference of from Dan Ahiezer, the son of Amish Shaddai. And that's it. Um, very interesting. We also, I mean, once you start this type of investigation, it's like building a case and building the character and seeing the dynamics. What can we glean of the information that's been left to us so that we might be able to fill in some of the blanks. And one of the things we know in Numbers, I'm sorry, in Exodus uh, 31, we're looking at the building of the tabernacle. And in Exodus 31, 6, And I, behold, I have given with Aholiab, the son of Ahismach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all them, all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee. These were people, by the way, uh, when it says here, to devise cunning works of gold, silver, and brass, uh, cutting of stones, and so forth. This tells you something very important, which will come up a little bit later in the message. These, at least this individual from the tribe of Dan, has some metalworking skills. Uh, probably later we will see the connection between metals, tin, Dan, and places that they may, we know, they were traveling to and from. Um, but we're still building a profile here. So we start first by gleaning whatever we can from the biblical records. Now, if you turn to, I've got multiple Bibles in front of me. I feel like I'm doing good here. <laughs> Uh, if you turn to Leviticus 24, it has um, an interesting reference. Remember, it's all this is little pieces of information that may help us with the bigger picture. So Leviticus 24.10, we have here, Now the son of an Israelite mother and an Egyptian father went out among the Israelites, and a fight broke out. In the camp between him and the Israelite, the son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name with a curse so that they brought him to Moses and they put him in custody until the will of the Lord should be made clear to them. And then Moses said, then the Lord said to Moses, take the blasphemy, blasphemer outside the camp. Uh, all those who heard him are to lay their hands on his head and the entire assembly is to stone him. So we know that this is this uh, person who spoke blasphemy was of the tribe of Dan. So, so far we were starting to build a little bit of a picture. We have tribe of Dan, metal workers, people who are craftsmen. Uh, we've got this individual in Leviticus 24 who is a blasphemer. 
which doesn't necessarily speak of the whole tribe. Um, then this is another one of these anomalies, or it's just something weird. I, I think it's strange, and I shouldn't say weird, but it is strange. And in Deuteronomy 27, um, we have kind of the split of the camp. And basically, um, it says here, half of the camp is going to stand on one side and bless, and the other half will be for where curses will be basically meted out. Um, on the same day, Moses commanded the people, verse 12, uh, Deuteronomy 27 and verse 12. Um, on the same day, Moses commanded the people, when you have crossed the Jordan, these tribes shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these tribes shall stand on Mount Ebal to pronounce curses, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, Nephtali. So it's kind of interesting. Moses gives the charge when they come into the land to be separated. If you look at a map, you see it just appears as a small line, but that was the fine line between blessing and cursing and the instructions of Moses. So now we move into the book of Judges and we encounter something that is kind of a little bit strange and that is we see for example um, they are told to go in and conquer the land. Let's go to Judges and there is a passage there that basically says that the Amorites, I believe, forced the tribe of Dan. That's Judges 1 and 34. And the Amorites for forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres in Aegelon and in Shalbim. Yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. So here's an interesting thing. They were all assigned territory. And this will be something I will have already probably addressed or will future address, but they were all assigned territory. And all this, this is not part of my message today. I want to just reiterate something. Starting at verse 19 of the first chapter, it tells you, and they couldn't drive these people out, and they couldn't drive these people out. These are all the children of Israel being told, when you come into the land, you've got to drive the enemy off your territory. Do not cohabitate with them. They will corrupt you. Do not intermarry with them. They were basically given specific um, commands, actually, before they went into the land. So it's kind of interesting that... Um, we read about Dan being pushed up into the mountains when you, if you consider where their portion of land was allocated was on the coast. Now I'll return to Judges 5 in a minute because that is the, probably the details of where we kind of start. But um, I want you to take notice of something. There's a good chunk of the book of Judges that will be attributed. See, each one of these judges is of the tribe of each tribe, uh, but you get to the last of these, and in chapter 13 is basically about Samson, Samson's birth, and it's ironic because we have basically from chapters 13 to 16, we have the most famous Danite, Samson, and the chronicle of his folly, if you will, of his life. Um, and then there'll be another section, um, so from 13 to 16, and then chapter 18 kind of picks up again on another subject, which I'm going to touch on in just a minute. But it's I'm referencing this to show you that even though we won't find too much of Dan um, really much later, but there's a good portion of this book assigned to Dan, which I find interesting. Now, we're here, so we might as well uh, read, and as usual, I will, although I've got both Bibles open here, I will read 
from the NIV. And Judges 18. So in those days, Israel had no king. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites was seeking a place of their own where they might settle because they had not yet come into inheritance among the tribes of Israel. So the Danites sent five warriors from Zorah and Eshtaol to spy out the land and explore it. These men represented all their clans. There's some interesting pieces of information here. Now you can see we tend to think tribe of Dan, leader, but no, broken up into, it says here very clearly, of their clans. They told them, go explore the land. The men entered the hill country of Ephraim, came to the house of Micah, where they spent the night. When they were near Micah's house, they recognized the voice of a young Levite, so they turned in there and asked him, who brought you here? What are you doing in this place, and why are you here? And he told them what Micah had done for him and said, he has hired me, and I am his priest. Then they said to him, Please inquire of God to learn whether our journey will be successful. The priest answered them, Go in peace, your journey has the Lord's approval. So the five men left and came to Laish, where they saw that the people were living in safety, like the Sidonians, uh, unsuspecting and secure. And since their land lacked nothing, they were prosperous. Also, they lived a long way from the Sidonians and had no relationship with anyone else. When they returned to Zorah and to Eshtaol, their brothers asked them, how did you find things? And they answered, come on, let's attack them. We have seen that the land is very good. Aren't you going to do something? Don't hesitate to go there and take it over. When you get there, you'll find unsuspecting people and a spacious land that God has put into your hands a land that lacks nothing, whatever. 600 men from the clan of the Danites, armed for battle, set out to Zorah and Ishtol. On their way, they set up camp near Kiriath-Jerim in Judah. And this is why the place west of Kiriath-Jerim is called Mahane, Mahanedan uh, to this day. For there they went on the hill country of Ephraim and came to Micah's house. The five men who had spied out the land of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that one of these houses has an ephod? Uh, other households, gods, a carved image, and a cast idol. So they turned in there and went into the house of the young Levite at Micah's place and greeted him. The 600 Danites armed for battle stood at the entrance of the gate. The five men who had spied out the land went inside, took the carved image, the ephod, and other household gods, and cast idol, they cast the idol while the priest and 600 men stood at the entrance of the gate. When these men went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, and other household gods and cast the cast idol, the priest said to them, what are you doing? They answered, be quiet, don't say a word, come with us, be our father and priest. Isn't it better that you serve a tribe and a clan in Israel? as a priest rather than just one man's household. Then the priest was glad. He took the ephod, the other household gods, the carved image, and went along with the people, putting their little children, their livestock, and their possessions in front of them. They turned away and left. Uh, when they had gone some distance from Micah's house, the men who lived near Micah were called together and overtook the Danites. As they shouted after them, the Danites turned and said to Micah, What's the matter with you that you called, called out your men to fight? He replied, you took the gods I made and my priest and went away. <laughs> what else do I have? How can you ask what's the matter with you? The Danites answered, don't argue with us or some hot-tempered men will attack you and you and your families will lose your lives. So the Danites went their way and Micah, seeing that they were too strong for him, turned around and went back home. They took what Micah had made and his priest and went to Laish against a peaceful and unsuspecting people. They attacked them with the sword, burned down their city. There was no one to rescue them because they lived a long way from Sidon and had no relationship with anyone else. The city was in a valley near Beth Rehob. The Danites rebuilt the city and settled there. They named 
it Dan after their forefather Dan, who was born to Israel, though the city used to be called Laish. So there's a couple things I'll finish reading and then I'll comment on this. The Danites set up for themselves the idols, and Jonathan, the son of Gershon, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land. They continued to use the idols Micah had made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. Now, what I find interesting about this passage is it tells us unequivocally it was customary for these people and eventually would become the pattern for them to invade, to take over, uh, whether it was in a peaceful or war circumstance. Um, they had no problem doing whatever they needed to do to get the job done. And then the habit of dropping their name, changing the name of a place to some portion. In this case, they've called the place that was Laish Dan, but that will be customary for them um, and some practice that we will see eventually everywhere. Now, if you turn to Joshua 19, this is a kind of going in reverse a little bit, but this tells you the allotment for Dan. The seventh lot came for the tribe of Dan, clan by clan. The territory of their inheritance included Zorah, Ishtaal, Ir, Shemesh. You can read all of them um, down to the area facing Joppa. But the Danites had difficulty taking possession of their territory. So they went up and attacked Lishem, took it, put it to the sword, and occupied it. They settled in Lishem and named it Dan after their forefathers. These towns and their villages were the inheritance of the tribe of Dan, clan by clan. So now we have a kind of confirmation. This is a pattern, and it will become a pattern of these people. So we can, to date, we can learn that these people were assigned a territory by water, coastal area, but we know that they were driven up into the mountains. They did not claim their whole territory. We can see that they had eyes on other places and seized those other territories, that they would leave their name or change the name of the place that they would conquer or seize to a Dan. Eventually it will be Dan, Don, Din, any combination of a D-N uh, name, and that's what we will see uh, as a reoccurring theme with this tribe. Now, what we're going to learn is Dan is very different from the Saka or the Sons of Isaac moniker, Beit Umri, uh, much different in many respects. Uh, we know that from First Chronicles 12.35, this is a list of men who are present to be part of King David's army. Those number 28,600 men. And here's the important part of what I want to say. We tend to think, because I still have to go back to Judges 5 and discuss that, we tend to think that the tribe of Dan, it's generally postulated that the tribe of Dan left in one fell swoop uh, during the period that occurs in Judges 5. However, and I say this very cautiously, I believe that probably much like some of the tribe of Judah, there may have been an initial uh, fleeing before they went into Egypt's bondage. So there may have been a small faction of Dan there. There may have also been an exodus, not may have. There was an exodus of Dan in his ships. We know it wasn't just that they were sitting in their ships. They were already trading with Tyre and along the way, places like Carthage. Uh, they, they were seafaring people engaged in trade already. So were they doing this solely during the period of Judges 5? No. Uh, I believe that because we have evidence that there are uh, men still listed from the tribe of Dan who are standing with David, that there was a portion of Dan that did indeed remain behind. Now we know this, that um, the portion that remained would have been at the time of uh, Ahijah before Jeroboam. Um, and then after that, we see them no more. We know that Ezekiel in his 
final chapters, he basically has a land, a, a land allotment for Dan. So it's important to note something. That final uh, allocation of land in Ezekiel is directly tied in with the book of Revelation. So when people get all crazy about Dan not being numbered amongst the 144 preachers of righteousness, um, and immediately, by the way, people say, well, that's because Dan fell into idolatry. Well, they all did. Uh, depends on the, the, the degree or the definition. And you might say, well, Dan did it first. Uh, but if they all did it, why would Dan be punished and not the other tribes? So it's, we have to be very careful in handling the scripture to not read what is not there. Okay. Um, and perhaps at the end of examining all of these pieces of information, both biblical and then, of course, onto the historical and archaeological, we might be able to make some conclusions. But right now, I don't think it's wise to try and do that because we don't have the tools yet in front of us. Now, I said I was going to go to um, Judges 5 because I want to show you something else. And this is what's interesting. Um, we know that in, in Judges 5, Jabin is basically uh, descending and attacking, and there is a call to arms, if you will, by Deborah, who's the judge at this time. And um, if you keep reading, uh, she says, My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. But then it appears like there's uh, something strange that is being called out, if you will. And that is from, from each of these tribes. Um, it says, men, the men who were left came down to the nobles, and the people have came, to, came to me with the mighty. Some came from Ephraim. And it's kind of a, a, a chronicling, if you will, of sorts. But the mention, and what is kind of disturbing, is it says that Dan stayed in his ships. And a lot of times I think people read that and they think, well, he was, they were just kind of camped out there and, you know, um, it, it, didn't, it didn't matter. No, I think it was deliberate, but let's be careful about something else. A ninth century prophet by the name, or he was a, a writer by the name of Eldad, he says that the tri tribe of Dan left because they did not want to shed their brother's blood. And I don't think that's accurate because we saw their activity um, in the 18th chapter that I read to you of, uh, we just looked in both Joshua and Judges to see their behavior. So I don't think it could be attributed to that. I think we will find that they were already uh, traveling the coast. There is definitely a connection, uh, Dan, with the Phoenicians. You know, a lot of people like to talk about how uh, this event in Judges 5, how they were in their ships, perhaps uh, they just went to their ships because they were scared or they were fleeing the battle. No, I believe that they were already in their ships. The question is, why were they staying in their ships? Um, I think they were already coming and going, and not, not the whole tribe, but a bulk of the tribe was basically in the process of departing. And I said, we have to be careful because the numbers, as I said during David's time, clearly show there was still a portion, clans of the tribe of Dan, yet still in the United Kingdom of Israel during David's reign. So that's why I said we need to kind of be careful about all of that. Um, okay, now, there's another passage that we should look at. And that is in Ezekiel. And again, will give us insight to something, I believe. Ezekiel uh, 27. And Ezekiel 27, verse 19. Okay. Ezekiel 27, 19. I'm, again, reading from the NIV, and I believe the King James reads uh, just a little bit different because it's, it says it in, in plain day who Dan is with. In your King James, 
Ezekiel 27 and verse 19. Dan also and Javan going to and fro occupied in thy fairs, bright iron, Cassia, Calamus were in thy market. Uh, the NIV, Danites and Greeks from Uzel brought, bought your merchandise. They exchanged wrought iron, Cassia, and Calamus for your wares. Kind of interesting, uh, the mention right there. So we can know this. Um, Dan was keeping company with the Greeks and we're trading with Tyre. And why is that important? Because Dan, remember when I was first introducing the subject, I explained how we see the children of Judah, uh, the descendants um, of Zara specifically, but the tribe of Judah has two children, twins, uh, Farah, Farah and Zara. We know that the Zarahite line uh, basically takes off and we see the two names, Chalcol and Dard. I'll probably come back to that in a second here. It's in my notes. Um, but why this is important is that that first wave of Zara descendants will make their way to um, Troy and the Grecian islands. So we can already kind of establish something by reading this particular piece of information. Dan also and Greece going to and fro tells you they had already established trade routes. They were already coming and going. And whether there is a direct connection between Dan, the Phoenicians, Tyre, Greece, but all you've got to do is follow um, basically the tracks or the trails that they left. And if you remember, Dan is like a serpent's, he's weaving a serpent's trail. And surely enough, much uh, much like the Saka who will weave a trail but they are not called or by any means referred to as serpent these people will definitely leave a trail um, so it's not impossible to speculate a couple of things here foremost what's not spoken about a lot here in fact I don't really think we have great reference to it anywhere is um, Carthage which happened to be kind of the 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 world convened there at a time, the crossroads of the world. So there's no doubt in my mind that Dan would have been making trips, either unloading or loading up goods in their ships. Um, and then we begin to read some records to understand more specifically who these people might turn up to be. So the Danites, or more specifically the Danai, are mentioned by Homer, Euripides, Strabo, there's a whole host of, um, we'll call them ancient historians, chroniclers. And so, for example, Euripides says, Danis, having arrived in Argos, made a law that those born of the Peles Giotto, or Giotai, throughout Greece should be called Danai. And we begin to see the name spread to the Peloponnesus and afterwards to all Greece. So you're going to find that same principle we saw where they took the town, Laish, and then he named, named it Dan. Um, this is going to be their pattern. Homer calls the whole of Greece Argos, for he says all Argives are Dania and Echoi. So it becomes clear the first city, Danai, stood with Mycenae or My Mycenaean culture and the Tyrans. It is now, as you start to look at a map and see where these people are traveling to or from, it begins to start making sense. They are definitely water people. They will be traveling and they know how to navigate. They will go a far distance. Diodora says that the Egyptians claimed the number of colonies spread from Egypt all over the world, that the exiles were led by Danis. So that's interesting from the Egyptian records. And we know from Herodotus that these ships of Danis made stops at Rhodes, where supposedly a temple was established by the daughter of Danis. These Danites, or Danis, spread. Um, and as they did, they're going to deposit their name. And we're going to see more and more places. I think if we follow this tribe's journey, it is indeed the fulfillment of 
what prophetically Jacob Israel spoke, uh, serpent by the way, just weaving a whole trail across water and eventually land. Um, so we know this tribe left, and I'm going to say I, I'm putting this in. I cannot say factually, but I believe that there is a section of this tribe that would have left prior to the um, children of Israel going into bondage. Then there is another group of people that I believe from this tribe that at the time of Deborah's charge to them, why is Dan staying in their ships? I believe they had already become a sea people. They were already traveling. And then, of course, by the time you get to the later chapters, we'll say once you're into the return of the people uh, and, and there on through the Old Testament, Dan appears nowhere except for, of course, as I mentioned, the land allotment in Ezekiel. So we know that places like Macedonia, D-O-N, D-A-N, D-I-N, they were considered Argives or Danites, and probably the most famous of these Macedonians, Alexander the Great, who himself is represented by a serpent. Uh, you're going to see that the serpent, just like I spoke about the tribe of Judah and the lion appearing on different flags, the serpent will be affiliated with Dan, and you'll find these will occur in many places, not just the standard for Dan, but in many other kingdoms and territories. In fact, some places you'll find the lion and the serpent, or the serpent and the eagle, and these are all referenced to their respective tribes. I think that's interesting. Um, we will encounter Dan, or a part of Dan, obviously affiliated or identified with Dana of Ireland. But of course, we will see them in Scandinavia, and of course, Britain at a later time. Um, now, for the old timers here, and many people who read up on this, the mention of the Irish Tuatha de Danann, or the tribe of Dan, these people, by this time, once they have that name attached to them, are renowned for their metalworking skills. Um, it is said that they possessed great knowledge in um, science. They were skilled workers. And again, that throws you back to perhaps generation after generation of skilled workers, metal workers, and so forth. When it comes to archaeology and archaeological evidence, uh, the area that Dan would have occupied had large amounts of metal found in it. Um, and equally of interest is that that metal was not domestic, but tin that came from Britain. And that will eventually take us to another individual, not in this message, but Joseph of Arimathea, who we know made uh, trips basically to the land of tin. Um, so these all eventually start to tie in. And as I said, I'm dumping a lot of information again because then we go back and we can micro-dissect each of these um, different, and they are their phases, and also I probably believe different groups and clans that will morph, that will, again, I don't think any one of these clans stayed purely together. Uh, at some point, there will be intermarriage. In fact, we know that Dan... All you have to do is go back to Samson. Samson took a wife uh, from a group of people that he was basically told not to, and his parents tried to talk him out of it even. They had a propensity for that. So from early on, we can see that is their nature. Uh, my goal in the upcoming messages then is to kind of pick apart and really, as I said, micro-analyze so we can get a much better idea uh, just not just some random people, and here's here's a map, and here's where they went. But it really will show you that in some places, for example, if we went back to look at the um, burial methods of certain of these tribes, we'll find out that no matter how uh, displaced they get or what tribes they belong to, they will have certain common denominators in their burial practices even, which is kind of remarkable. Now, we know we'll be looking at places eventually where the tribe of Dan went, Dan, Don, Danapur, Danube, Dardania, the Dardanelles, 
uh, Danva, a Scythian Danite tribe, uh, Danai, Shushan, possibly connections to Sweden. Uh, actually, not possibly, we know connections to Sweden. And we also know that Devon and Cornwall in the southwest of Britain was also referred to as Danonia. So they just love to put their name anywhere. Dan, Din, Don, you name it, or they name it, it stays. So perhaps at this point, I want to circle back to what I was talking about, about the children of Judah, because there's always this big confusion, I find. I find it actually with almost every person who is trying to track the tribes will begin to get a little bit confused that the children of Zara, as I said, they're in the Bible until the third generation and then they disappear. That gives us the information to know they in fact departed before the children of Israel went into Egypt's bondage. And Chalcol or Chalcol and Darda, which is, as I said, the third generation, uh, these two will sail away and appear to uh, basically establish cities in areas of Cyrus, Greece. Um, if you remember, I mentioned Cadmus, who brought the alphabet to the Greeks, and I'm not sure that that's the right term for that particular period. Um, and it is believed that Cadmus may have been Phoenician, but there's no reason to doubt by this time, perhaps even, that this might not have been a union of a Dan, uh, tribe of Dan and a Phoenician or any other person um, union producing Cadmus. There, there's a big question mark there. Um, so Cadmus, as we know, goes on to, to found the Greek city-state of Thebes. And from all the pieces of information that we see, um, we are now seeing with good evidence that Dan and those first individuals I reference Chalcol and Darda may begin to get a little bit confused and who is attributed to settling what that's where it gets a little bit um, we'll call it muddled um, as we know the Greeks had a lot of mythological influence on their daily lives so it's no wonder that the mythological Cecrops who supposedly founded Athens is none other than Chalcol of the Zara line and it's strange because Cecrops, who, as I said, Chalcol, is of the line of Judah, not of the line of Dan, but it is said that he was half man, half snake. I don't want to confuse you, but anyway. We know that Chalcol went on to establish 12 cities, and if the record is correct, he goes on to establish other colonies and lands, including the line that would produce uh, Irish kings, and that, again, is, requires more time. I, I don't want to just be dumping and leaving you to sort it out. But um, we're actually going to see what I'm going to call a Danite collective. And that is along the way, I'm sure they are picking up other cultures, other people. Uh, we know they stopped in Spain, um, places where we find the Zara name, of course, um, Zaragoza being one of them. Some attribute the, the name Zaragoza to being attributed to Caesar. I, I don't think so. I believe it is a Zara-related uh, name. And of course, I skipped over the Isle of Sardinia, Sardinia. So we see Judah and Dan influences everywhere. Um, you know how I love to go back to archeology span and things that, are, things that are found in the earth can be very revelatory. So in the 1800s, Large amounts of Greek coins, somewhere between two and 3,000 Greek coins were found in Scotland uh, in approximately the same area as the Newton stone. So now I ask you, do you start thinking that these are just mere coincidences or people would say, oh, that's a forgery. Well, how do you get all of this? And they're connected. Uh, think about it. These possibly would be souvenirs. Um, I'm sure they saw it as money, but souvenirs of where they formerly lived or maybe that money was left there, who knows under what circumstances, but we definitely know that they brought a lot of substance with them when they left Greece and a lot of that gets deposited in the earth in Scotland because we have so many incredible digs 
with pieces of uh, art, jewelry, other things, coins, which we know do not belong in that land, were never part of that land, and obviously are identified with um, areas that are definitely on the course of trajectory of these people traveling, of course, from the areas of Greece and the Isles. Um, the Vetus Chronicum Holcite, say that five times, tells us without question the Danes were of the tribe of Dan, known as the Dansk or the Donsk. And then that becomes obvious that we have two distinct groups of people. Uh, one group that would come by sea through Spain, and then at a little bit later time, we have another group that will come by land. And as I said, this requires some explanation. Both known as Danans and Danes, but that's for a later time. So eventually we see the angles, and I again have to go back at some point and explain all this, but we see the angles and the dents will mix, and the angles are referred to in another place as angles, and some of them were even referred to as, brace yourself, as Saka angles, um, and some were, they've got like subnames of every group. So here we're going to see the angles in the dance mix and produce the Anglo dance, who will become known as the Jutes. This is going to get more confusing. And after the Jutes left uh, to England, the dance or the Danes will occupy, after the Jutes left, the Danes will occupy Jutland or Jutland. So a tribe of Northmen will leave Scandinavia uh, in or around the end of the 9th century, uh, towards the 9th century, and settle in northern France. And we will come to know them as the Normans. And now you can begin to see the tapestry of history all coming together. During the 11th century, these Normans came to Britain under the leader William the Conqueror, who defeated the English at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. That same year, William is crowned King of England, and as they say, the rest is history, right? But it's still too generic. There's still so much more to fill in, if you will. Um, the a professor, uh, Gunther is his name, a German ethnologist in his Racial Elements and European History, says the racial composition of England is worthy of special mention. It owes much to racial mixtures of Viking bands, Celts, Angles, Jutes, Danes, Norwegians, and Icelandic peoples. The English history is rich in movement of peoples. And then, of course, we'll come to understand how the term Anglo-Saxon occurred, which again is another melding of people. And that will bring us back to Saxons, to the sons of Isaac. So it seems impossible everywhere you turn, you're going to encounter someone, a subgroup or clan of these people. Um, and again, if you think about it, this, this actually opens up a bigger question. Um, we have a record of many people, solid people saying Manasseh and Ephraim, Manasseh, uh, the USA, Ephraim, Great Britain, uh, or, or the British Kingdom at an earlier point. Um, it, but it's also imperative to see how much of other tribes settled there that will become probably known as the larger part of a corporate or collective body. And that's something we need to talk about because there's too much homogenization or we'll call it uh, conflation of peoples and not enough understanding the term itself, Ephraim, which again, remember, House of Israel, Ephraim, Samaria. Uh, and so recognizing who belongs to what, but we can see in the process that a lot of different people will flood into this land, uh, Ingla land, which eventually becomes England. And from there, we see the lines of the kings at crystal clear without no one's going to argue these are absolute rulers. I presented a chart earlier, which I will represent again at some point, showing all of these different kings and a lot of people, because they're unfamiliar with that history, think, oh, that's impossible, that couldn't be. But remember, 
We have two dynamics to look at. One is the promise given to Sarah, kings will come out of you, which is not just talking about um, necessarily limited to the seed of Isaac, because obviously um, we could talk about that lying down and spreading out, but we do see kings, for example, through the Saka clan or through the sons of Isaac. We will see kings that are part of the Danite or Danan people. So you start putting this picture all together and you can definitely see the prophecies that have been laid out and then what we'll be able to do once we have clarity on who these people are is to go back into some of the scriptures that have been less clear or for some people they wrestle with understanding. You go back and you start reading. First the starting point is the correct division between north and south and then recognizing who belongs in these in these groups and that brings you to conclude something very important which is if only 50,000 people came back from the tribe of Judah to rebuild Jerusalem and the rest of those Judahites are scattered and the rest of the northern kingdom is scattered we're looking at God's promises made good a populace that one cannot number if, even if you tried and I believe that in the future messages going to look at kind of section by section giving a little bit more time will hopefully clear up a lot of what I call the blur that happens in the process of trying to sort out who is who and then one more thing once we get into prophecy we might be able to better establish uh, who the main players are as this may sound a little strange if people keep morphing over time then the people that we will be dealing with at a future time may not be the people I hope this makes sense that we started off with so that's something that we need to keep investigating uh, I right now I'm going to just leave you with all this information Ugh. and I look forward to seeing you live in person next Sunday. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday. I'm, as I said, excited to be back with you next week live. In the meantime, stay safe. I'll be looking at you. Good day, folks. Come to this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, worship and bow down.